If you had a dream of the exotic East, it might look much like this. But this is one of Europe's great cities, Istanbul. Its people, the Turks, are determined to be European. Their government hopes by the end of this century to make their country a full member of the European economic community. This is a film about their ambition and the obstacles in its way. I believe that all developing countries are in a card game and they are given a certain amount of cards and whoever plays their hand the best under the, those giving circumstances is the most successful, successful country. And I believe countries are like businesses. If it is run well, it can go ahead. If not, it crumbles. When history was dealing the cards, it didn't hand out many trumps to the Turks. A thousand years ago, they marched into Europe from the east, and they remain today on Europe's eastern fringe, astride the great international seaway of the Bosphorus. The other side, across that new soaring bridge, is still Turkey. But over there, it's Turkey in Asia. This vast, poor nation is literally a bond between the continents, from the Mediterranean to Arabia. Only one thirtieth of Turkey's land area is in Europe, where Bulgaria and Greece are its neighbors. To the south, its neighbors are the oil-rich but sometimes warring states of the Middle East. To the east and north lies the Soviet Union. The seaway that divides their country is open under international convention to ships of all nations. And here is a Soviet fleet exercising its right of passage past the heart of Istanbul. But it isn't from Russia that Turkey faces its most dangerous threat. Their Arab neighbors have oil, Turkey doesn't. The OPEC fuel price rises of the 1970s have almost ruined Turkey. Rami Koch, who runs Turkey's largest private company, explains what went wrong. In the 70s, we were uh, uh, having a growth rate of 7% on the top of each year, and we borrowed our future. And now we have stopped and have to breathe and earn some money and, and start investing again. Naturally, this was coupled with uh, government economic uh, decisions that were wrong at, at those times. And we had 100% uh, inflation and the, the oil crisis that came in 1973 added up to our problems. The oil price increase is also uh, followed by the price increase of the products produced by Western countries or, let's say, industrialized countries. That means Turkey has been squeezed in two pressures, from the oil producing countries, on the other hand, from more developed countries. The two-way squeeze has been too much for Turkish democracy. Rival leaders for 20 years offered competitive promises to the people. But they haven't delivered either prosperity or peace. First in 1960, then again in 1971, the Turkish army abolished parliament. The politicians like the system, the army disapproved. Each time, the soldiers have handed back power to the politicians, and the politicians have failed to keep the peace. This is the Taksim Square shooting in Istanbul, 1977. At least 36 people died. By autumn 1980, 150 people were dying each week from political murder. On the 12th of September, 1980, the army stepped in again. The Turkish army is proud of itself. It's the only organized and disciplined force throughout the whole country. The soldiers are taught to think of themselves as a special sort of elite, the guardians of the national tradition. The last real fighting this army did was 60 years ago, 
Defeated in the First World War, the decadent Ottoman Empire saw part of the Turkish heartland claimed by the Christian powers of Western Europe. The army fought back, throughout the invaders from Greece and Italy, and throughout the former Sultan, too. The founder of the Turkish Republic was the leader of that army, the brave general, Mustafa Kemal. He took the name Atatürk, father of the Turks. Atatürk dreamed of a peaceful, orderly Turkey. Civilian governments have failed to keep the peace. But the army's coup d'etat of 1980, its third in 20 years, went smoothly. Before dawn on the 12th of September 1980, troops took over parliament, the ministries and the broadcasting stations. They locked up the leading politicians and promised to work out a new civilian constitution as soon as possible. The press, of course, was censored. The Turkish army is run and equipped on American lines. It's the second largest in NATO. General Kenan Evren, the new head of state, is American trained. So are most of his colleagues. They say they want an American-style democracy. NATO training has made the army expert at internal security. And by their coup last September, they ended the worst of the street terrorism. The security forces have sometimes behaved brutally, particularly towards political prisoners. But last autumn, at least, there was quiet in the streets. The nighttime curfew only made the days busier. Turkey's basic problem remained as it was. They can't afford imported fuel to keep their transport running. Turkey's bankrupt. It desperately needs vast loans from overseas just to keep going. But the country has its own private serenity. They may not be rich, but their big fertile country provides its slow special pleasures. A long, quiet smoke, plentiful food, homegrown or home caught, a few little luxuries that almost anyone can afford. With unemployment a permanent habit for many, they make an art of leisure. <laughs> Even in the heart of Istanbul, one of the world's most ancient and cosmopolitan great cities, life isn't too different from that of a big village. Cleanliness for Muslims is part of godliness, as it's always been. The Turks grow and make and sell to each other practically everything they need, except for oil for fuel and modern machines. For most of them, their country is still, as it has been for centuries, a self-contained and self-sufficient, almost a rustic world. But once every five years, the streets empty, as Turkey faces up to the fact that will change the life of every Turk. It's census day. Until everyone's been counted, they stay at home by order under military curfew. Between 1945 and 1975, the population of Turkey more than doubled, from 19 to 40 million. By the year 2000, it will more than double again. There will be over 90 million Turks. And the extra people will live in the bursting cities, not in the old way on the farms feeding themselves. The old way was settled and confident. The children of every town and village start their day with a profession of faith in their future. I am a Turk. I am honest and industrious. May my existence be sacrificed for that of the Turkish nation. O oh, great Atatürk who gave us our unity, I give you my pledge that I shall follow the paths you have opened. Happy are they who declare themselves Turks. It'll be a new and crowded Turkey that these children inherit. <laughs> 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 
more than half the Turks still live in villages like this one, Öyül Bey in Anatolia. The government has installed electricity, but people can't afford to switch it on. As the price of energy soars, the old ways have come back. Cow dung cakes to burn for warmth and cooking are once again the staple fuel of Öyül Bey. The crops and animals suffer. The dung that's burnt would bring rich harvests if spread on the fields for manure. Since they've got electricity, some villagers have television as well and the aerial captures from the sky images of unattainable wealth. Most of the men are away at work in the towns or overseas. Woman power is the one source of energy that the people can afford. And the oil crisis of the 1970s has made them keep on using the old pots and the old back-breaking ways. But work as they may, they still can't do without the tractor. 90% of Turkish farms now have them. Tractors are indispensable to the wheat harvest. And in 1980, a tonne of wheat just about bought one barrel of crude oil. pay for the fuel that brings in the harvest and makes the country self-sufficient in food, Turkey in the 1970s borrowed all the money anyone would lend. And they need to borrow much more. The land goes dry in summer. They need to invest to build dams, to conserve water and give electric power too. This country could double its food production, but to do it, they need capital. Western Europe has investment capital and know-how too. And that's one main reason why Turkey wants to join the EEC. But a lot of what Turkey's farms produce isn't what Western Europe wants. The olives ripen on the tree, but nobody will bother to pick them this year. It's hard labor, and nobody will pay for it while there's a world olive oil surplus. Tomatoes in their season come off the fields in tons. The canning firms got it organized, supplies the seed, buys the fruit, pays the laborers a share. It's farming on mass production line. But again, this is a tough competitive business. The Italians and Greeks inside the common market want to keep their share of it. The Spanish and Portuguese want to be able to sell their tomatoes too in the rich Western European market. Women do most of the work planting, tending, picking, hammering up the boxes. Their share of the crop is a living for a lot of families, however low the pay. Practically everyone in Europe eats Turkish tomatoes, usually as tomato paste or sauce or ketchup. Italian farmers in particular complain that they can't compete against the cheap Turkish paste. But the wonderful machines that actually do the processing are imported from Italy. Selling expensive machines is better business than selling tomatoes. Present, the European community imports huge quantities of Mediterranean fruit. But as more Mediterranean countries join the community, it'll need new rules to regulate the trade. If they're outside, the Turks could be in trouble. Turkey has only got one unique money spinner, its biggest export, nuts. These pistachios will end up in someone's ice cream. They're precious, they can make a farmer's fortune, but they're a slim base to build a whole economy on. Each year on their holiest day, they sacrifice a sheep and give its meat to the poor. This sheep fair by the mosque happens each year right in the center of the capital, Ankara. But even in the city, the newcomers bargain over their annual sacrifice.
almost 100,000 people a year migrate into the city from the countryside. To make a home, the newcomers squeeze onto any vacant plot of land, piling houses up the steepest hill. And somehow, using the skills they have and the implements they were used to on the farm, the newcomers hustle for a living. Here, along the pavements in the dust, an industrial revolution is on its way. It takes determination and amazing ingenuity to make a living this way, keeping old American cars on the road when they rightly belong on the junk heap or in a museum. The workers aren't insured. These boys are 13 years old. They'll probably be sacked as soon as they can claim adult wages, but they're learning a trade. Bashir started life as one of these unauthorized apprentices. And on that slim basis, he's built himself a reasonable life. Out on the fringe of the town is his home, and he's proud of it. Ankara's industrial suburbs are full of these particularly Turkish houses. They call them Gecekondu. The law says that if you can find some unoccupied land and put up a roof over it, nobody may tear it down. It's an entirely do-it-yourself property. Bashir isn't even really sure he owns it, but it's home for his big family. His grandfather died when Bashir was a schoolboy. The family moved to the big city. Bashir's just got married himself to a girl from the remote Black Sea village where he was born. Bashir's grandmother shares the house. So does his mother, and his kid brother, and his sister too. Life in the city is tough, but hard work brings a few luxuries. Kemal Atatürk, the father of the Turks, might well be proud of the house Bashir built. To a few, Turkey's industrial revolution has brought immense wealth. Sakip Sabanju's father was a cotton picker. The sons are multi-millionaire. Faraza, Türk toplumuna 30-40 sene evvel sorsaydık, nüfus bu denli büyüyecek ve bu nüfusun bütün isteklerini ulusta üreteceksiniz. Bunun cevabı olmayacak şeyi istiyorsun. Hayır olurdu. Hayır olmadı. Daha ileri bir adım gitseydik, bununla da kalmayacaksınız. Siz ayrıca dış memleketlere ihracata başlayacaksınız denseydi, ona da cevabımız rüya görüyorsun, hayalperestsin, vazgeç bu rüyadan olurdu. Ama şimdi size söylüyorum, üstüne basa basa dikkatinize sunuyorum ki, biz Türk toplumu rüyayı gerçekleştirdik. Hayal zannedilen işi başardık. Onun için competition'dan, rekabetten de korkmuyoruz. Competition would be something new to Turkey's private industry. There are half a dozen huge conglomerates running businesses like this iron farm. They've all been carefully fostered by the government. Imports from abroad are restricted. Home production is encouraged. What these firms do is to buy foreign machinery and know-how and put it to work to supply the protected home market. They don't have to be cheap or efficient since there's no competition. If you can afford to buy a car in Turkey, you buy a Turkish made one or do without. There's a Turkish name on the cylinder block. But the design of the car and many of its components come from abroad. Some components made here are shipped off for assembly in Western Europe. It's price that counts, not nationality in the multinational motor industry. The Turkish government keeps out imports of finished cars, particularly from Japan. The cars made here are an old Fiat design from Italy with a Turkish name on it. The plant's partly Turkish owned and it provides a lot of jobs for Turkish workers. Labour is relatively cheap, no robots here, so methods of manufacture are old fashioned and the quality of the cars is low. It's much the same with refrigerators. Because labor's cheap, the finished goods are cheap. 
This plant can deliver a complete fridge freezer, Italian style, for about 50 pounds sterling. But nobody in the EEC is keen to import handcrafted Turkish fridges. For that matter, few people inside Turkey can afford to buy any sort of fridge just now. The plant is working at about half the capacity it was designed for. Industries like this, designed to supply the home market with cheap, low-quality goods behind powerful controls on imports, don't make much profit. No wonder the industrialists want to change and are interested in the European common market. But the first result of dropping import restrictions would be the firing of most of these workers doing work that machines could do better. Turkey's industrial crisis is the worst in its history. The home market has collapsed. They are now trying to sell goods all over the world. The easy ways they're used to are over. The only real profits in Turkish manufacturing now come from its most modern plants. This one makes artificial fibers. Raw materials and machines are imported and most of the production is exported. A plant like this could be literally anywhere. The West European textile industries claim it's unfair competition because their own plants are less up to date. There's one supervisor to 12 looms, monitored by computer printouts in English. No jobs here for a growing population. But most Turkish industry, even today, has very little to do with the outside world. This factory makes furniture out of local wood. It's owned by a bureaucracy, a trust to finance a university and a hospital. Its profits come from contracts awarded without competition by the government to make desks for bureaucrats. It's astonishingly inefficient. Civil servants don't complain to the makers if the drawers don't fit their desks. And this is exactly the sort of protected industry that the new breed of Turkish industrialists would like to sweep away in an economic revolution to make Turkey more efficient and more European. We know the consequences. Uh, it will not be easy in the beginning. Uh, we will have to change our thinking. We will have to rethink our industrialization uh, program. Uh, some of the business will probably go out and collapse, but we will form other businesses. Uh, we will have to attract more foreign investment in Turkey because with foreign technology and foreign money can we only compete with Western European uh, businesses and industry, and we will also concentrate more on agriculture and foodstuffs like Spain would do and like Italy does and like most probably Greece will do. From its North European beginnings, the EEC is reaching out towards the shores of the Black Sea. We've looked at some of the problems for Turkey. Our next film will examine its brighter hopes.